First published in June of 1958, Chinua Achebe's first novel, Things Fall Apart, is a landmark that helped bring African literature into the imagination of not only international readers, but African ones as well. The novel does multiple things at once. It recreates African society before European colonization. It highlights and celebrates a cultural national identity. It discusses issues of gender and patriarchal masculinity. It helped to legitimize African oral traditions and aesthetics as forms that could be used in the African novel. And in Achebe's own words, it shows Africans that their past was not one long night of savagery from which the first European acting on God's behalf delivered them. The question I want to engage in this video essay is, how does Chinua Achebe use gender in Things Fall Apart to teach us lessons that we can apply to our own contemporary society? For those of you watching who have not read Things Fall Apart or read it too long ago to remember what happens in the novel, there are two summaries done by the channels Crash Course and Wisecrack that I recommend. I'll leave links to these videos in the description section. In the penultimate chapter of Things Fall Apart, Okika, one of the great men of Omofia, speaks to the other men about how they are going to handle the imprisonment of their leaders by the European settlers. This is a great gathering. No clan can boast of greater numbers or greater valour. But are we all here? Are all the sons of Omofia with us here? They are not. They have broken the clan and gone there several ways. We who are here this morning have remained true to our fathers, but our brothers have deserted us and joined a stranger to soil their fatherland. If we fight the stranger, we shall hit our brothers and perhaps shed the blood of a clansman. But we must do it. Our fathers never dreamt of such a thing. They never killed their brothers, but a white man never came to them. So we must do what our fathers would never have done. I hope you notice the centering of males in this speech. It would be naive and narrow-minded to blame the destruction of Umofia solely on the Europeans who entered Umofia and their colonial project like Okika does. There is much more at play here and Achebe seems acutely aware of this. Achebe uses Umofia to represent African societies at large in order to show us that the deeply gendered ways in which these societies lived contributed to their ultimate demise. Because numerous systems of knowledge are gendered in Things Fall Apart, Achebe shows us that had there not been a preference for violent dominating masculinity, Omorphia, and perhaps by extension Africa, would probably have been more united against the Europeans and not been destroyed from within as Okika suggests in his speech. To understand the novel's commentary on gender and power, it is important to first understand the distinction between gender and sex. A person's sex is related to their biology. At our most basic level, we humans are divided into females who have a pair of X chromosomes and males who have one X and one Y chromosome. As such, sex is something that remains unchanged throughout human societies and history. There are other biological ways to categorize sex, like hormones and sex organs. Some scholars make the argument that there are more than two sexes. Anne Foster Sterling, for example, argues that in addition to male and female, there are three other sexes that we tend to group together as intersex without understanding that there are numerous nuances that exist in this category. Foster Sterling talks about what she calls pure hermaphrodites, or herms, female pseudohermaphrodites, or firms, and male pseudohermaphrodites, or merms. Herms are people who have both ovaries and testes, the egg and sperm producing vessel. Firms are people who have ovaries and some aspects of the male genitalia, but lack testes. And merms are people who have testes and some aspects of female genitalia, but no ovaries. 
Foster Sterling goes on to say that in addition to these five sexes, there are many other categorizations of sex that can be made using the ideas of sex organs and hormones. The point I'm trying to make here is that sex is a lot more complicated than we think, even from a biological perspective. We can try and simplify this by saying that at the end of the day, all these different sexes can be reduced to male and female based on chromosomes where an individual either has a pair of X chromosomes or one X chromosome and one Y chromosome. The gender concepts of woman and man, however, are cultural rather than intrinsically biological. As a result, who qualifies as a woman or a man changes depending on which society is under consideration and what period of history is being examined. Many cultures around the world have rites of passage that children must undergo in order to transition from childhood to adulthood. Those who do not go through these rites do not qualify as women or men in their community and can be excluded from certain privileges that their peers enjoy. For example, in many African societies, one of the most important rites of passage boys must go through to get to manhood is circumcision, where the foreskin of their penis is cut off to symbolize the letting go of childhood and childish things. It used to be that if you do not go through this rite, in addition to numerous others, you were still considered a boy even if you were in your old age. Today, however, some cultures are not as strict and one does not have to go through any rites in order to be considered an adult. It is important to note that some cultures acknowledge more than two genders of woman and man. According to Duane Bradboy, Native American cultures, for example, acknowledge five genders, woman, man, two-spirit woman, two-spirit man, and two-spirit. In the overwhelming majority of societies around the world, including the society Achebe describes in Things Fall Apart, there is an overlap between women and female and men and males. However, in all these societies, you do not automatically become a woman or a man because you have the correct configuration of chromosomes or because you have gone through all the rites of passage. Females and males must continuously prove their femininity and masculinity by performing these roles in order to retain these cultural identities. Achebe demonstrates this most clearly in Things Fall Apart in the gendered systems of knowledge that appear in the novel. Perhaps the most noticeable gendered system of knowledge in Things Fall Apart can be found in the oral stories that are passed down from generation to generation. Achebe's narrator makes it very clear to the reader that the stories that women tell are silly and meant for foolish women and children. One of these stories is the story of Mosquito and Ear that Okwanko recalls his mother telling him when he was a boy in chapter 9. Okwanko stretched himself and scratched his thigh where a mosquito had bitten him as he slept. Another one was wailing near his right ear. He slapped the ear and hoped he had killed it. Why do they always go for one's ears? When he was a child, his mother had told him a story about it, but it was as silly as all women's stories. Mosquito, she had said, had asked ear to marry him, whereupon ear fell on the floor in uncontrollable laughter. How much longer do you think you will live, she asked. You are already a skeleton. Mosquito went away humiliated, and any time he passed her way, he told Ear that he was still alive. There are numerous other stories like this in the novel, including the story of Vulture and the Sky, that Okwanko's firstborn son, Nwoye, recalls his mother telling him in chapter 7, and the story of Tortoise and the Birds that Okwanko's second wife, Ekwefi, tells her daughter, Ezinma, in chapter 11. These stories form part of an oral tradition that Achebe fused into his writing as a way to appropriate the language of the colonizer. The stories appear in the novel as part of a knowledge system that women use to teach their young children lessons in order to build character. For instance, the story of Tortoise and the Birds teaches the danger of being arrogant and greedy. These stories are also used to explain certain things in the natural world. For example, the story of Vulture and Sky can be used to explain weather patterns to children. And other stories are used purely as entertainment, like the story of Mosquito and Ear. However, these stories are not as valued as the stories that fathers tell their sons in their obis. We are told that those are masculine stories of violence and bloodshed that are meant to make boys strong and tough in order to protect homophia. 
By reinforcing these strict categories of women and men's stories and giving more value to the men's stories, Umofian society encourages violent forms of masculinity as the more desirable form of gender identity. Another system of knowledge that is used to reinforce this dichotomy between women and men in Omorphian society is agriculture. The yam is referred to as the king of the crops, a man's crop, and Achebe's narrator tells us that Okwanko thought that yam stood for manliness and that a man who could feed his family on yams from one harvest to another was a great man indeed. Since yams are labor intensive, the size of a man's field is seen as a signifier of his work ethic and wealth. In contrast, the crops that women farm are not seen with the same reverence. The narrator tells us that while Okwanko is trying to build his own barn of yams through sharecropping as a young man, he also has to fend for his father's house. His mother and sister worked hard enough, we are told, but they grew women's crops like cocoa yam, beans and cassava. The men of Umofia may look down on the farming of these crops, but by Achebe's own admission, these women's crops formed an important part of a well-balanced diet for Ibu people. These two gendered systems of knowledge are used to naturalize the superiority of men who perform a violent and dominating masculinity that Okwanko performs in order to rise socially in his community. This means that the superiority of men who perform this violent and dominating masculinity over women and what are perceived as feminine men is seen as being ordained by nature and something that cannot be changed. However, there is another system embedded in Omorphian society that privileges men over women and what are perceived as feminine men. Another gendered system of knowledge that is used to cement the superiority of violent and dominating men in Umorphia is Okwanko's personal philosophy and outlook on life. Much of this is influenced by his father, Unoka. Achebe's narrator presents Unoka to the reader as lazy and improvident. We are told that Okwanko was ashamed of his father since Unoka died without taking any title, being heavily in debt and leaving Okwanko no inheritance. Unoka belongs to a class of men known as Abalas which is another name for a woman, but is also used to mean a man who had taken no title. As such, the last thing that Okwanko wants is to be seen as being like his father. He works exceptionally hard to build up his yamban and is said to have been ruled by one passion, to hate everything that his father Unoka had loved. Gentleness, idleness and weakness. These are characteristics he is determined to remove from his son Nwoye. Okwanko says in chapter 4 that he would rather kill his son than have him not be able to hold up his head in a gathering of the clan. Quadro Osei Nyame presents an alternative view of Unoka by Margaret Turner. Turner argues that even though Unoka, a skilled musician and storyteller, is seen as a failure in material terms, if his stature was measured on a scale that is comparable to someone like Achebe, that of ensuring the culture of his people is recorded and preserved for future generations, then Unoka could be considered a great man as well. This philosophy of gaining respect in the clan by earning titles and becoming wealthy goes to Okwanko's head and makes him arrogant and proud. Okwanko's arrogance is rebuked by an elder at a gathering of the men of the clan at the beginning of chapter 4. Okwanko says to Osugo, a man with no titles who contradicts him, that this meeting is for men. Even though everyone sides with Osugo, Okwanko's attitude that men without titles should not be given the same opportunity to speak as titled men is basically endorsed by his society at large. Okwanko's masculinity is synonymous with violence and a lack of expression of emotion, and this helps him to rise from great poverty and misfortune to be one of the lords of the clan. As a result of Omofia's value of this kind of masculinity, Okwanko is said to rule his house with a heavy hand and that his wives lived in perpetual fear of his fiery temper. In chapter 4, during the week of peace, a time when no violence of any kind is allowed, Okwanko beats his third wife for not returning home in time to make his midday meal. His wife is heard wailing and some neighbors come to Okwanko's compound to hear what is happening. It is important to point out that the neighbors came to make inquiries and that Okwanko was made to pay a fine only because he beat his wife during the sacred week of peace. Had it been any other time during the year, there would be no consequences for what he did. 
This is demonstrated later on in chapter 5, when three days before the New Yam festival, Okwanko beats and almost shoots Akwefi for killing his banana tree and his other wives are the only voices of dissent. But he does not listen to them. The lack of male voices that speak up against the physical abuse of women shows us that the homophobia presented to us in the novel is perfectly okay with this violence. It is not only physical violence that is used to assert this power. The silencing of women's voices and the policing of their behavior is also used. In chapter 2, when Okwanko tells his first wife that Ikemafuna will be staying with them and that she should look after him, she asks if he will be staying long with them and Okwanko snaps at her to do as she is told. We also see this again in chapter 5 when Okwanko tells his daughter Ezinma to sit like a woman. There are numerous other systems of knowledge in homophobia that are gendered in a way that cements the power of men who perform a violent and dominating masculinity. These include the justice system administered by nine men appearing as masked spirits and the spirituality of homophobia which appears to value women but really only treats them as vessels of fertility. All these systems of knowledge help to maintain the system of normalized power and superiority of men who perform a violent and dominant masculinity in homophobia. As a result, women and those men classified as outcasts and abalas are marginalized. These are amongst the first people to convert to the new and strange faith of the missionaries because the missionaries offer them a space in their world that homophians were not willing to. For someone like Nroye, he is moved by the compassion the missionaries show to abandoned baby twins by rescuing them from the evil forest. The missionaries help him to reconcile an internal conflict brought on by an Umorphian practice that he did not agree with, that most people accepted and did not question. At the end of Okwanko's exile to his motherland, he hosts a feast for his maternal relatives and one of the elders gives a speech. In it, this elder says the following, I fear for you young people because you do not understand how strong is the bond of kingship. You do not know what it is to speak with one voice. And what is the result? An abominable religion has settled among you. A man can now leave his father and his brothers. He can curse the gods of his fathers and his ancestors like a hunter's dog that suddenly goes mad and turns on his master. I fear for you. I fear for the clan. This is an eloquent premonition that precedes the third part of the novel where the tragedy of Okwanko and ultimately the tragedy of Omorphia unfolds. It is important, however, to note that there is still a centralizing of male power and dominance. If the society was more inclusive and distributed its power evenly amongst all Omorphians, the Ibu clan would perhaps have stood as one against the Europeans as the elder wanted. <laughs>